and it's day four and we are on the home stretch. For today we're going to talk about generalized survival models which are also known as flexible parametric models. We're going to spend an extended uh, time talking about non-collapsibility. We're going to do a bit of a review on nested case control studies. Uh, we'll describe uh, standardized mortality and, uh, mortality and incidence um, rates and we're going to talk about some possible biases in um, survival analysis when we're reporting on survival analyses. So what about smoothing? Um, um, we're going to be using um, splines for a, a few things. Um, so you, you um, in Poisson regression instead of um, uh, um, modeling time as a step function what we could do is do fine time splitting um, and then sort of like uh, we'd like to actually sort of do a smoother across the, the um, time intervals rather than using many parameters. One of the approaches for doing that smoothing is to use splines. And splines are a way of modeling um, continuous variables in a flexible way um, in a, a number of different regression contexts. For, um, for cubic splines, what we do is we have knots which is a fancy term for, for, for saying values that split up um, the, the x values um, into intervals. And then for the knots, that the, the user has to either specify the number of knots, such, such as three or four or five, and then that will, there'll be automatic knot placement, such as using quantiles of the event times. Or that the user has to specify the number and the placement of, of the knots, or we could just sprinkle in many, many knots and then try and find a function which fits nicely, which, which is not too wiggly um, using penalized regression. Um, the, the, the user also has to, to specify the type of cubic splines, and if we do um, B splines, then they're, they're cubic before and after the first knots, and that's in, in, implemented in the BS function from the splines package, or natural splines, which are linear before the first knot and linear after the first knot and that's implemented in the NS function. There are other sp um, splines including periodic splines, um, cure models which are flat after the, um, the, the, the first knot and so on but we'll focus on um, we'll mainly use natural splines. Uh, a picture is worth a, a thousand words. What we've done is we've g g generated some um, some data, which are the, um, um, the, the the circles. Then we've specified knots here, here, and here. And that um, could, could have been chosen just to sort of um, separate out the, um, the data. Then the, the knots form intervals. And this first interval, what, what we do is we fit a cubic. And then the next interval, what we do is we fit a cubic, fit a cubic, and a cubic. But if we're looking at these, they don't look that nice. So the first thing we we do is say, let's actually have that they join up here, here, and here at, at, at the knots. And then what we do is we now find, yes, they're joined. That looks quite good there. That looks okay here, but it looks a bit, bit, bit weird here because the slope coming from the um, for, from this side is quite different to the slope coming from, from this side. What we can do to, to, to make this look, look nicer is say we want the, um, the, the slopes to, to, to be the same at the knots here. So then this is assuming continuous first the, the derivatives. Now the slopes are the same here, slopes are the same here and, and, and here. But the rate of change, it looks very, very flat here and then it's ch 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 and changing more quickly here. And it would actually look slightly nicer if, if we had both continuous first and second the derivatives. And then we, if we do that, it starts to look quite pretty to, to the eye. So we've got continuous first and second the derivatives, which are, um, are called B splines. And I, I, I think that um, is, is a reasonably good d description of those data. So we can use splines to model for the, um, the the baseline hazard, and one approach um, would, would be to use Poisson regression, split um, um, finally 
for time and then use um, splines for, um, for, for, for smoothing. This works especially well for multiple timescales. An alternative approach is to model for a transformation of survival, the um, so-called generalized survival models or flexible parametric survival models. And the most common of these, these models is, is done on the log cumulative hazard scale. So that means if log of the cumulative hazard at time t, given covariates x, is some smoother for, for log time, plus a linear predictor, where s is the smooth function, such as you using natural splines. Um, once we've got the cumulative hazard scale, we can do two things fairly easily. We, we, we can calculate survival, which is equal to exponential of the, uh, the minus cumulative hazard, and we can also calculate the hazard by differentiation. So um, the, the derivative with respect to time of um, the um, cumulative hazard is equal to the hazard, um, and there's a fancy formula here. What we can do is for a unit change in one of the exposures, um, divided by the hazard for the, um, the baseline, we plug in some math, we simplify things, that cancels out, that cancels out, then we, we end up that the hazard ratio for a unit change is equal to exponential of beta. So we have a proportional hazards model. So one of the elegant approaches, uh, aspects of th this approach is that we, we can um, directly model for interactions between covariates and between covariates in time. And that allows us to, to, to model to directly for non-proportional hazards. So what we can have is you've got your baseline for time, you've got your time fixed effects, and then you've got interactions between some of the covariates and smoothers um, for log time. And then we can directly estimate time varying hazard ratios, which is beautiful. We've implemented both parametric and penalized, um, generalized survival models in the RST PM2 package on CRAN, um, but um, there's also the um, FlexServe um, package on CRAN and the STPM2 command in Stata. Um, the parametric models to default using natural splines for the smoothers by um, time, and then the um, investigator needs to um, specify the degrees of freedom by using an argument D if equals three or four or five. The penalized models do not need to, to, to specify the degrees of freedom. And then these models are closely related to generalized additive models. Um, um, and, and you can actually do um, generalized additive models for Poisson outcomes, um, which, which is another very elegant approach. Showing some code, we um, create an object called fit4. Uh, from STPM2 with the survival time in months for a cause sp specific death, adjusting for sex, age group, and calendar year of diagnosis from the colon data re restricted to, to, to localized cancer. And then we need to specify the degrees of freedom for, for the baseline, and five is reasonably generous. And then we compare the, um, the co coefficients from the STPM2 PM2 with Cox, Poisson Fine, and Poisson. And what, what we find is that uh, STPM2 looks reasonably similar to these other approaches. So the, the, the hazard ratios are from STPM2 are very similar to, to those from a Cox model and from a Poisson model. Since the baseline um, has it, is, is modeled, it is an e easy to include non-proportional hazards and, and interactions. And the, the time scale is included as a continuous variable. So there's um, no more implausible step functions. It's also e easy to, to present the, the results using graphs. And this um, approach um, is um, very good for, for doing predictions and ex extrapolations. So what we do is we take the um, colon data and we add in some binary in indicators for distant and regional. 
we drop the unknown stage from um, from the, the, the factor and then remove the unknown stage. That's just setting up some some data. And then what what we do is we do a fit for STPM2 um, for six and then an indicator for regional and an indicator for distant from using the, the, the known data. We use five to degrees of freedom, but then we also allow for time varying time varying effects, three degrees of freedom for regional and three for distant. And then what we that we can plot from this fit the hazards from from data which from are males for distance is equal to one and then we set up the x level we can also do line um, lines with confidence interval for, for for regional and also for localized and then we, we, um, th this shows us the hazards by time for distant regional and localized um, stage uh, allowing for time uh, for different baselines. Now the beautiful thing, thing here is we can also um, fit for time dependent hazard ratio comparing to distant with uh, localized colon cancer um, and this will actually be true for both males and females um, because it, it was a, a man effect for sex. So then what, what we have is we got a hazard ratio out. Um, the baseline is for localized. And then what we do is we increment the variable for distance. So this will go from zero to, to one. And then we sort of find that there was an initial increase here in the hazard and then a decrease here. And actually it drops below one here. So I, I think this is a beautiful plot. We, we can also um, plot this with a, uh, a log on the, um, the y-axis. And this shows much closer um, what the, um, shows m much more clearly uh, it, it dropping below um, one here. So what we can also do is um, plot for survival differences. So again, we start off with males. Now that this is important because it's not a hazard ratio. And then we sort of start off with um, localized as the reference. And then we sort of say, if, um, instead of using the var equals uh, distant, we, we can instead do, do, do something which is much more ex explicit and say exposed, exposed, which is a function taking some data. And then we take um, transform the um, data where we um, change um, the distance is equal to one. Um, so this could also have been done as being um, shorter would be um, var equals um, distance. That will actually um, do, do, do the same thing. The nice thing about using the, the exposed is that you can do virtually any contrasts. You, you could add, you could increment different values or um, you, you could change multiple um, values at the same time. So, and then the, this shows that um, we, we this, this shows the survival differences here. Um, and then what we find is that the cumulative, that the survival difference peaks here. And then um, because the hazard for distant drops below one, then this starts to rise here. So, and also the hazard is getting closer. Um, this shows distance, distant versus localized, and then this is regional versus localized. And um, and this shows that the nadir is around, uh, um, around probably seven years. Um, we can also do um, time dependent hazard differences um, doing much, much the um, same approach. Um, so if we go back to the 
previous slide, if we change this to, to being H diff, then we can actually get um, hazard differences. Although I think from a causal perspective, the survival differences is much more important and probably the hazard ratio um, has got a nice interpretation. Okay, let's take a bit of a um, step back and think about what happens with proportional hazards models with unmeasured covariates. And what we're going to do is we're going to assume that you've got two covariates, x and u, and that, that assuming that they're independent, such as from a, a, a randomized controlled trial, where say x could be a treatment effect and u could be other covariates. It also means that um, u is not a potential confounder for x. So u could be just a bunch of other things which are associated with the outcome, but they're not assumed to, uh, but they're assumed to not confound. Intuitively, the initial events for the Cox model will be randomized or independent, which, which will have a nice causal interpretation. But later events are based on factors that may affect survival, which, um, which could lead to a bias. So we're going to say here, may lead to a bias. And, and what, what we do is we, um, we initially consider a causal d d diagram for survival to time t and then survival to time t, t plus delta. So what we have is x is, x is assumed to affect survival to time t, u is assumed to affect um, survival to, 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 to time t, x is assumed to affect survival to time t plus delta, and u is assumed to affect time um, uh, survival to time t, t plus delta. X and u are not associated in this causal diagram. And if we were to model for the hazard, then then um, that the hazard here means that S of t is associated with S of t plus delta. So so this could be a, this could cause problems. Now, to simplify this, if we consider how x affects survival at time t or time t, t plus delta, then we do not open the path um, th through u, and we can get causal estimators for x. So this, there's no path here, so we actually wouldn't um, need to, to model f f for u here or here. We could just look at the um, effect from x to survival at this time, or x at, um, um, to, to, on survival at this time. So this su suggests that survival differences or ra ratios can have a, a nice causal in interpretation, provided that there's no, uh, um, no unmeasured confounders. This um, causal diagram. If, if we are modeling for, for the hazard and we adjust for x, then we implicitly adjust for s of t, and that's acting as a collider. And importantly, that, that, that opens a non-causal path from x, from here to here, from here to here, and then all, all the, the, the way around here. And unless we can actually um, close the path by modeling for everything that's associated with, um, with um, survival, um, which will be very difficult in practice, then um, we, we will not be able to get a, um, a causal estimator. And I should, should, should emphasize that this is, um, this, this is generally true for the Cox model, but it won't be true for other models, including Olin's additive hazards model. So, an alternative approach um, would be to actually um, uh, use simulation with an unknown example. So what we do is we sort of say, we know what the, the, the answer should be. Um, can we estimate the, the answer from the available simulation? So, so we start with a known truth and then see whether we can estimate a known target parameter from simulated data. So for our um, for this simulation, what we do is we assume that x is binary, and then we assume that u is normally distributed, 
and what we will we'll, we'll do is um, assume that the time to, to event has um, a, a constant hazard, so that means it's going to be exponential, and assume that the rate varies by both x and u. Um, it, it not, it's not um, terribly important, but we'll also assume that c is uniform, and that they uh, assume that the uh, censoring is independent of t. So what we do is we sort of say here, oh, excuse me, is we've got x is independent from u, and we assume that, that, that both of these are affecting time t, and then we've got censoring, which is assumed to be independent of everything else, and then the, the, the minimum of the event time, so the, the minimum of these two is equal to to y, and if t happens first, then delta is equal to 1, otherwise delta is e equal to, to 0. And we, we also assume that in the uh, the hazard formulation, the coefficient for u is 1, and the coefficient for x is 1. So, so what we have, x is Bernoulli with probability a half, so it's just basically a coin flip. Um, U is normally di distributed with mean zero and a standard deviation of three, and then T is, is assumed to be um, a constant hazard with respect to time, but it, it varies, so it's exponential of minus five um, plus, plus X plus U, and then C is just assumed to be um, uniform, but that's not important. So we sort of set the, the, the random number seeds. We do it for 10,000 in, in, in individuals. We do um, a, a bunch of coin flips. Then this is normally d d distributed. Then this is um, constant hazard with this rate. And then this is uniform between 0 and 10. And then the actual observed event times is the pairwise minimum of the, the t and c. And then the um, delta is when t is less than c. Um, and then we output a, a data frame with, um, with uh, observed time y, covariate x, covariate u, and the event indicator delta. So that's how we simulate. And what we should be trying to do is get out a coefficient of 1 for x and a coefficient for, of 1 for u. Right, now how would you model with if you knew both covariates x and u? And then how would you, you model with just covariate u, sorry, with just covariate x when u is unmeasured? Now for these particular data, there are many, many ways that you could model for what are comparatively simple data. Um, so what we could, could do is we could do Poisson regression, we could do Cox regression, and we could do flexible parametric models. If we do that, so what we do is we do a GLM, um, the delta is the outcome, adjusting for x and u with um, using y as the, um, the person time. So we do an offset of log of the, um, the, the person time from our, our data set for Poisson. We could also do a Cox for survival time um, y with the event indicator delta, adjusting for x and u. And then um, the um, um, Cox, uh, so the STP. PM2 is almost identical, but we also need to, to specify the d d degrees of freedom f for the baseline. And then this is fancy code to give this table where we want to look at the x coefficient. And these are all very similar and very close to 1. And then the standard error here is slightly smaller um, because this is actually the correctly specified model where it's assumed to be piecewise constant. So. But um, in, in, in all of these, we've adjusted for both x and u, and we get pretty close to the right answer. So in summary, all three models estimate the um, target log hazard ratio, which is approximately 
A equal to 1, and the standard error for Poisson is similar to, and slightly smaller than those for Cox and STPM2. Now, modeling only for X without U. What we do is, basically the code is the same here, the only difference is that we are only adjusting for X. Then we've got the same code to be able to pull that, that out, and whoa, this is very, very different. These values, so this is not approximately equal to, to, to 1. So th these are quite, quite different. So when we don't adjust for U, now don't forget, U is not a confounder. U is not a confounder. It is just a covariate which is associated um, with the outcome. And it's strongly associated with the outcome. Um, and then what we find here is that this does not give us um, fit values. Um, that, that these values are actually about half of what we would expect. So the uh, and these are called marginal hazard ratios because we're basically um, estimating the, the, the marginal without um, um, u. That in this case, they can be quite different to the conditional hazard ratios from the previous models. As an exercise, um, let's see exercise 14, we can investigate whether the hazard ratios are time varying for the um, STPM2 models for both X and U or for, for both only X. Now this is a bit technical, I won't take too long. So what we do is we do an STPM2 adjusting for both um, covariates and allowing for a time varying has a ratio and it's practically flat, which is not um, surprising. Um, and what we can do is we can um, plot the hazard ratio um, um, for a fixed u for an increment in x, and then um, that's, that, that, that's that's basically um, approximately exp exponential of one. So, and then what we can do now is fit. A, a marginal model not adjusting for you, again allowing for a time varying hazard ratio, and again doing a, a hazard ratio here for an increment in x, and then we find a very, very strong time varying effect. So the conditional effect is constant, that the marginal effect starts off at a, at a value which is actually quite similar, and then declines down. Um, um, towards 1. So the hazard ratio for x with both x and u is conditional on the, the, the values for, for u. Um, for our example, the, the, the hazard ratio is constant with, with, with the respect of time. The hazard ratio for x for, for, for the model with, with, with only x is marginal or an average over the values for u. For our example, the, 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 the ratio starts close to exponential of 1 and is then strongly attenuated. If we fit a marginal model with a um, constant hazard ratio, then we estimate an average of the time varying um, hazard ratio. So if we go back to here, um, if we actually averaged across those, we'd probably get out a value here, which I think is actually close to exponential of 0.5 which is actually what we estimated. So, um, individuals with, with, with higher values of X, X and U are more likely to, to have an event earlier, so there is strong selection. At later times, the distribution of um, um, uh, U and X for the survivors are expected to have lower values. For normally distributed unmeasured covariates U, theory says that the uh, marginal has a ratio for x will be attenuated. For unmeasured covariate um, u or unmeasured, uh, so the, the, the covariate u or un unmeasured heterogeneity is also called a random effect, and exponential of u is also called a stat statistical frailty, which you, 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 you might hear used. We would prefer to have a model which is collapsible where we want the marginal um, estimate without the um, measured covariates is the same parameter as the conditional estimate. 
Um, and a related example is for odds ratios, which are also not collapsible. To, to emphasize, we have assumed that u is not a confounder for x. Consequently, this is that this issue is similar for both randomized control trials and observational data. We can reduce the, atten the attenuation by modeling for covariates that are not confounders, but we shouldn't need to do this. For proportional ha hazards, there are two, 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 two conditions for non uh, for, for hazard ratios that aren't e equal to, to, to one, where the non collapsibility is negligible. So, the first thing we can do is we can assume that we've got rare events. So, we, we basically look at outcomes very early on. And we, I think we, we also made this um, the ends slightly larger. And then we find um, that. It's not, so this is without U, without U, and without U, and these are much closer to one. Yay! Also, if there's a smaller frailty, so instead of the, um, the, the, the um, instead of the, 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 the rubber effect being three, so that was three, now we change it to being one, and then it, if we do that, then this is much, much closer um, to, to one. So um, small, um, a small random effect or rare outcomes, and then the Cox will, can give a um, causal estimator. So non-collapsibility is less of an issue for, for rare events and for a small frailty variance. Unfortunately, for small unclustered um, events, we can not assess the, the size of the frailty. So modeling indirect um, and indirectly helps but we still cannot characterize the unmodeled frailty. Other approaches that we um, could do is um, regression standardization. So what we do is we fit a model um, to, 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 to the data and then we, we calculate standardized hazard ratios and standardized survival differences. So standardized um, survival, S bar of T at time T is calculated from, what we do is we basically calculate survival at time T given um, covariates weighted um, by, and the, these WI could be just, just equal to one. But um, um, standardized survival is weights of the predictions across a bunch of individuals. Um, actually, I think what we do is you do one over n. Oh, sorry, one over n will just give you the average, and that's the example that we we show here. Now, the 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 the, 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 the big, big question is, how do we do this? What we can do is we can estimate standardized survival under counterfactual exposures. So S bar K here is the, the average of survival to time T um, given um, UI setting K, um, say setting X is equal to, to K. So what, what we do is we take all of the, the, the observations and then assume everyone ha was exposed and then everyone wasn't exposed. So this shows the, the, the example comparing all exposed and all unexposed, and then you average. We can do this in um, STPM2. There is a, these are societal differences. Um, actually, these are conditional. So this is X plus U. Here, we're looking at survival differences, conditional, um, and we get this sort of straight line here. We can also do mean survival differences, where um, new data is the original data, setting everyone to being unexposed, and then we increment the x here. And then this shows this nice pattern here. Instead, what we could do is this is 
fitting without the um, the, the, the U with the time varying, and then look at the survival difference, um, and then the, the pattern here and here is very, very similar. So that means that the, the marginal from this model and the standardized from, from the, that this model tell a very similar story. We, we can do, 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 do the same, same thing with the hazard ratios. Conditional for modeling for, for both is flat, standardized um, for both um, shows that this is the um, this is the hazard ratio for X, this is the hazard ratio for X um, from, from the marginal and from the, the standardized. And then so now we've introduced splines. Um, we, we can think about how we could use the splines uh, to, to, to model for the, um, the baseline hazard. One approach would be to use Poisson regression. We'd split finally by time. Um, and then smooth using the, the splines. And that actually works particularly well for um, multiple timescales. An alternative approach, instead of using Poisson regression, would to, to, to be modeled for a transformation of um, survival and then fit a, um, a regression model within a um, survival context rather than assuming that it's piecewise constant within the time splits. So, and then if, if, if we do a transformation for survival, these are these so-called generalized survival models or flexible parametric survival models. The most common of these models is on the log cumulative hazard scale. So what we do is we sort of say that the log of the cumulative hazard at time t given covariate x is some smooth function of log time plus um, um, a bunch of sort of standard time fixed linear predictors. Um, where it is, it is a smooth function, and I think the default for the parametric models that, that we use um, is natural splines, but we can use other smoothers as well. One advantage um, of the um, cumulative hazard scale is that we can e easily c c calculate survival, so that means survival at time t given covariate x is equal to exponential of minus lambda capital lambda of time t um, given x from this expression here. So, and we can also calculate the um, hazard by d differentiation so that the hazard is the, the, the derivative of the cumulative ha hazard, which is um, which if, if we do some math is equal to the cumulative hazard times the, the derivative um, of the smoother divided by t, which is not, um, this is not so um, important. What is pleasant about the log cumulative hazard scale is that um, by default um, it gives us pr proportional hazards. So if we have an increment in one of the covariates, the baseline is x naught, and then that's in increased by one unit. If we do, do the math, things tend to cancel out, and then we're left with a proportional hazards. Um, what's beautiful about these these models is that they extend very um, easily for non-proportional hazards or time-dependent effects um, by, by including interactions between covariates and splines for time. So the log cumulative hazard is some baseline, that's like an S0 function, it's a baseline smoother, um, plus the, the, the time-fixed effects, plus interactions between smoothers for log time and covariates xj where j is an index for the time dependent effects and it could be one or two or three of these there's not not, um, not normally many of them uh, we have implemented both parametric and penalized to generalize cell models in the rstpm2 um, package on cran um, um, you could also see the flex serve um, package on cran and the stpm2 um, command and stator uh, the parametric models default to using natural splines for the smoothers, which means that the investigator does need to specify the degrees of freedom. But apart from that, the model formulation should look very similar um, to Cox. Uh, for the penalized models, we don't, don't need to specify the um, degrees of um, freedom. 
um, and what this does is it actually chooses a smoother, which gives us a, a reasonable, um, like a balance between a reasonable model fit and if you don't want the, the function to be too wiggly. Um, and these penalized models are very closely related to a, a model class, which you, you, you may have heard of before, called generalized additive models, um, um, which um, are like an extension of generalized linear models. And we can also use the generalized additive models with the Poisson data. And that, um, and that works particularly well for multiple timescales. So other approaches to address non-collapsibility. What we could do is we could actually use several, several models which are collapsible. And um, a popular choice has been Olin's additive hazards model, which if we had a continuous hazard, that the hazard at time t given covariates x is equal to some baseline for um, um, uh, baseline hazard plus covariate of x, and it's an addition here and here. These are all addition, so they're sums of the covariates times time dependent fx beta j. So this actually is a time varying effect. Although this is a hazards model, um, the linearity means that the, the marginal and conditional um, models are s similar f f for covariates that are not confounders, um, and it is collapsible. The um, different exposures are assumed to act like competing events, which are related to Rothman's causal pies rather than um, rather than proportionally. And this additivity does not seem to hold for some types of events, such as um, cancer survival by Asian sex. The, these models are implemented and available in the time rig um, package on CRAN, which allow for um, left truncation and right censoring. Um, what's interesting is that when, when we actually fit these models, they, they, they're reported using non-parametric time-varying cumulative effects. So you have to, in some sense, sort of differentiate in your mind. So that means what we, um, what we actually get, get out are estimates um, of the um, cumulative ha hazard, which um, is expressed as the cumulative baseline. You actually get out this entire term here, and then um, you um, get out each of these terms here. And then to actually, um, if, if we we're interested in this or this, we, we have to, to, to think about differentiating of the um, differentiating the cumulative effects. Note that this model does not hold for our simulated data. Next. An alternative promise which shows cons um, an alternative approach, which actually shows considerable promise, is to use accelerated failure time models, where the, the, the variable t is equal to some baseline effect, so baseline um, time to event variable t naught times exponential of minus beta x. And this is, um, this, this is proportionality on the time scale. Um, we have recently developed smooth accelerated failure time models, which allow um, some flexibility in the um, survival baseline. So that means what we have is that survival to time t given covariates x is some smooth baseline function times t um, times t times exponential of minus beta x. And if you see the RST PM2 AFT function, so. Our the, the, the simulated data, which are exponential, um, can also be, be fitted as an accelerated failure time model. So what we can do is, um, using the RSTPM2 package, we, 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 we can do a fit um, dot xu um, using the AFT function, using solo time for uh, to time y and event that delta, adjusting for both x and u with four degrees of freedom for the S0 function. And then what we can do is we can also do to do the same fit with just X in it, with the same degrees of freedom, and then we can combine these data. And what we find is that when we fit for both variables, this is very, very close to the target, which is minus one, because it's 
minus beta here rather than plus beta. But if we don't fit for the u, which are um, strongly associated with the outcome but not associated with x, if we don't fit for u, we again get a value which is very close to minus 1. So that is excellent use. That shows, um, for this example, collapsibility. You should also note that if you don't adjust for u, your standard error is much, much larger. But the, but the nice thing is we don't necessarily, um, we almost certainly will not know all of the vari um, variables which are associated with the outcome. Um, so al although we lose, this sort of shows that if we adjust for more variables that aren't confounders, we can reduce the standard error, but it doesn't actually, um, it doesn't actually Im improve the, the point estimate. And we see from this example that the AFT models are collapsible. Right, change, change the topic. We're now going to talk about um, uh, likelihood calculations for the Cox model, and then that will lead, will lead us on naturally to, to, to thinking about nested case control studies. And an important um, concept for um, both uh, the Cox model and for um, nested case control studies is the concept of risk sets. Um, and understanding uh, risk sets is um, central to understanding um, risk sets sampling um, such as used for um, case cohort and um, case control studies, which we'll present shortly. So the risk set at each failure time is the collection of subjects who were at risk of failing at that time. In theory, only one individual um, can fail at each failure time, and we, we can calculate the conditional probability of failure for each um, for, for the subject who actually failed. And the partial likelihood function is the product of these conditional probabilities. That's a bit of... Um, a mouthful. I think it's probably easy if you um, sort of th th think of an example here. So imagine that we have five individuals at risk of having an event, and each of those in in individuals have um, uh, has its lambda one, lambda two through to lambda five, which th and and those hazards may be different since the in individuals have um, um, may have different covariate values. Conditional on one of the five failing, and in this case we assume it's the number two, the conditional, what have we got here? The conditional probability of failure for the subject who actually failed is your lambda two divided by the sum of lambda one plus lambda two plus lambda three plus lambda four plus lambda five. Now for a cox, what we can do is that Lambda t is equal to lambda naught time, um, times exponential of x beta. We can substitute in for, for lambda 2 is now going to be lambda naught t times exponential of x2, which is the covariate for, for, for the second individual, times beta, to divide it by the, 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 the sum. And they've all got lambda naught exponential, and then they've all got different covariate values. And then very nicely, the lambda noughts, they all cancel out. And then what we get is exponential of um, the um, x to 2 beta divided by the sum. And the notation here is those are the individuals who are in the risk set R. So R rep represents those who are at risk of having the event at the time of this event. So, so it's the sum for i belonging to the risk set of exponential of x i beta. And then the, the likelihood function is the product of, of those con con conditional probabilities for all of the observed event times. This gets a little more tr tricky to um, write um, when, when, when we've got ties, but for um, if, assuming that we've actually got the distinct failure times, what we have is um, that the full likelihood is equal to the product over the um, events of the exponential of the events, exponential 
of the covariate times beta for the events divided by the sum of the um, in individuals who are in the, the risk set of for that jth event of exponential of um, minus xi beta. And that's actually what is um, plugged into um, the sort of um, maximum likelihood optimizer, and from that we can also get standard errors. Uh, there could be f um, further covariates where we, we could have, um, say, um, k, k potentially time varying covariates. So then um, the, um, the beta i, say, x i beta gets changed into, you might have xk here, um, xjk, and it's possible that these effects could vary by time. If we don't have this, then we don't have time varying effects. And when we do Cox pH without the TT function, then we get this um, this likelihood. And with the um, TT function, we, um, we, we're actually sort of saying we're allowing um, these values to, to change with respect to time. So now that these calculations do not d d d depend on the underlying failure times themselves. All that, that happens is that we need to know the risk sets and the covariate value. So we use time here for defining the co covariates, but we don't actually use time elsewhere. And although this is not strictly a likelihood, it is a partial likelihood and actually it has all of the um, properties of a um, full likelihood. Um, if we do observe multiple failures at the um, same time and we have ties, then um, we will need, need to use an approximation to try and sort of tease apart what, what would have come first. So, and this is conceptually um, similar to a matched on time or an, an, an uh, intensity density sampling for a case control study. Um, and the Cox partial likelihood is actually almost ident identical um, to the, 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 the likelihood for a conditional logistic regression. The only change is that you put a star here on the RJ, where RJ star is a subset of those at risk. So all the rest is the same. Okay. When fitting the um, Cox model, we're essentially um, comparing at every failure time the characteristics of the individual who failed to the characteristics um, of all individuals who did not fail. So, and we could think of this as a case control study matched on time. And then at each failure time, we have one um, case and several hundred or possibly more controls. What we could do instead is um, select, for example, five controls per case, and we would not lose that much efficiency, or it could be 10, or it could even be 100. But you could see that um, that if you get a very large cohort, this could be very large, um, so, so far as that the risk sets. So these reductions would all be a lot smaller than this here. Our controls are selected from the, 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 the risk set and a single individual may be a control at multiple time points um, and, and, and a control may later um, become um, a case. And in this sense, this is a nested, uh, um, nested case control design, so which is a case control study which is nested within a cohort study. We like these designs because um, that they allow for statistical efficiency um, and a substantial savings in cost and time. So and we, we may wish, um, so if it's actually expensive to collect data, this is a really um, amazing way where you keep all of the um, um, data on the, the, the cases and then you um, sample um, for, um, um, for the controls and say you, it might be expensive to um, to pull um, records um, for say um, patients diagnosed with 
colon um, carcinoma. So this will substantially reduce the size of the study. Um, so what we would do um, is that we'd sample from the um, control sets um, and then we'd extract information for all, all individuals who died, but only a sample of those who did not. Um, another ideal application is when we've got a population-based cohort and we're t t t taking blood samples with the aim of studying the association between, between say, genotype and disease risk. And we store, we store the blood samples and only after follow-up um, um, of the cohort um, do we analyze the samples for, for the cases, the individuals who developed the, the, the disease, along with a sample of controls. Um, and generating a nested case control study is um, straightforward in R. Um, but what we'll first do is we'll repeat the full cohort analysis of the uh, lo localized colon carcinoma data, and then we'll show an example um, using the nested case control. So what we do is we subset the colon data for localized stage, and then we um, de de determine the event as being caused specific death, and then we do a COX on 12 time and months for this event being uh, cause specific death um, for sex, age group, and calendar period of diagnosis. And then we give it a summary. And then we find that these has the ratios here. So it's if that's standard. And now what we can do is using the Epi package, and then we set the seed so it is reproducible. And then we sort of uh, do CCWC for um, case control. The exit time is survival time of months. The failure is the, the event for these data. And then what we're going to do is we're going to include sex and age, but we're going to match on age group with three controls per um, case. Um, and to, to do this silently, otherwise it gives out a lot of output. Um, and then if we actually look at the, um, the, the um, detail of this data frame, what we find is we have a, we have something called set and map. I think map might be row number. And then these are the times. Um, it shows that there's, you've got this, set here and you got here that this um there would be another two in the set um and then we, we find that the times are are all the um same here the age group has been matched but sex varies and calendar period of diagnosis varies and we have the event here so so then we um given those data we fit a C logit, which is a conditional logistic with failure, adjusting for sex um, and year, and then stratifying. So this is like a uh, stratified COX, but um, stratifying on sex. So that means uh, the calendar period is going to be partial. So the um, risk sets in the time of um, the, the risk sex is partialed out. So then what we end up with is having these two values here, which are comparable to the results from here, six and count the period of diagnosis here. And these estimates are similar to the um, full cohort, but the standard errors are, so if you've got the um, 0.057 here, compared with, point, it's quite similar there in the year, but um, they are slightly larger. So sometimes we only uh, have um, outcomes for an exposed population and no unexposed um, population to compare with. And then uh, we sort of can't calculate rates, um, sort of comparing the exposed with the un unexposed. What we can do instead is actually estimate the uh, rate or the number of events in the exposed. 
and then um, and then c c compare that with the expected rate or expected number of events for a standard population. As an example, we might be just um, studying uh, disease incidence or mortality among um, individuals from a, a given um, occupation, like um, maybe farmers or painters or airline cabin crew. Um, or we could be looking at, um, say, um, cancer incidence in a, a cohort which has been exposed to ionizing radiation. So the uh, standardized mortality ratio is the ratio of the observed number of deaths in the study population to the expected number of deaths if the study population had experienced the same mortality as the um, standard population. And this is um, an indirectly standardized rate. Um, and um, we can either talk about just standardized mortality ratios or standardized incidence ratios, um, depending upon the sorts of outcomes that we are working with. So what we, um, as an example, we may be interested in looking at the uh, hazard ratio of c c cancer among organ tr transplant recipients um, compared to the general population. And there's a nice reference there. Estimation in R. To, 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 to estimate an SIR or an SMR, we typically assume the expected rates to, um, to depend upon our, um, sort of uh, the, the person times um, split by age, sex, um, and possibly calendar period. Then we use the serve split function to, 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 to split up the, um, um, the follow-up time in the um, same way as, as we have for the background rates. So um, so if the um, standard population rates are in five-year age groups, then we split using the same categories. Then we multiply the expected rates by the um, the um, that, that the person time to get the expected number of events in each category. And then we collapse. And um, so we collapse to get the total number of, of observed cases and total number of expected cases, O and E, to, to calculate the um, standardized incidence ratio, which is just the observed divided by the expected. And we can also uh, have covariates and do modeling. Um, and then instead of using the, the log of the, um, the, the, the person time as an offset, we use log of the expected as an offset. Um, so, for an example, with a um, binary exposure X with uh, collapsed data, um, so that means, say we had a um, group where we had, ex um, had observed exposure for some of them, and then, um, um, say, for some that they were exposed, and then, and then the, the, the others were not, and then we sort of use the um, background, uh, the, st the standard population rates, and then the, um, the person time to, to calculate the expected. And in this case, it happens to be 10 and 10, but then the, the observed were 21 in the unexposed group and 32 in the exposed group. Then th those are the data, and then we can do a GLM, Poisson re re regression, using those data with the exposure, um, and an offset for the log expected, where the observed is being the outcome. And then this shows that the um, after adjusting for the um, factors in the standard population, which could be age and sex, then the um, SIR would be 1.52 with a 95% confidence interval between 0.88 and 2.64. Just an example, which um, is restricted um, to only those exposed. I was involved in this um, study, where it's a cohort study of men exposed to, to, to household, household asbestos from the Australian Capital te Territory. Um, and then we did a huge record linkage study and then um, classified in, in individuals who were actually in homes that had high um, we're measured to have high 
levels of asbestos um, um, exposure. And then there ended up being um, seven um, men who had mesothelioma, and uh, um, and then the expected was 2.75. It's here. So then we can do a, a Poisson test, com comparing the observed seven with, with the expected 2.75, and then we, we we find that there was a two and a half times in increased risk from living in homes with um, um, raised asbestos exposure with this confidence interval. Moving on to a discussion on uh, selection biases in observational studies. Um, so what we may be interested in is whether um, um, patterns of survival from a subset of patients can be generalized to a wider body of patients. However, selection bias may occur when um, um, patients treated at a particular clinic are not rep representative of a, um, of, of a general class of patients. As, as an example, um, um, more s seriously ill patients may be, be re referred to a specialist clinic. Selection bias also occurs when treatment is assigned based on characteristics of the patients, which actually um, confound any comparisons between the treatment groups. So um, patients treated more aggressively are generally healthier than patients tr treated conservatively. As an example, um, um, men who were re referred, who had localized prostate cancer, who were re referred to have a radical prostatectomy may have been m more healthy than, than men who were put on to watch for waiting. As, an, as a second example, um, for, for women diagnosed with advanced breast cancer, um, um, th th there's been a comparison between bone, bone marrow transplant coupled with high dose chemo um, versus conventional therapies. For this second example, the um, high dose chemotherapy a a company with transplant involved har harvesting um, bone marrow or stem cells from the patient prior to chemotherapy. That the patient then received high dose chemotherapy, which adversely affects um, bone marrow. After chemotherapy, the stem cells and bone, bone marrow are replaced with the hope that the um, drugs have killed the, the cancer cells and that the um, bone marrow will um, re regenerate after the um, patient dies. Um, will, will, will regenerate before the patient dies of infection. This, this procedure was started in, in the late 1970s, and by the late 1980s, the, the results looked very promising. Patients with advanced breast cancer who were given transplants had remission rates of 50 to 60 percent compared with the 10 to 15 percent remission rates achieved by conventional means. However, subsequent examination of the data showed that the women receiving the transplant treatment were carefully selected to be younger and in general, um, in general, and generally in good health. And um, um, randomized controlled trials have found no difference in survival for women who were randomly assigned to have tra transplants and those who were assigned to conventional therapy. In general, comparisons of survival according to treatment should be avoided in observational studies, although we will come back to this. It is possible to adjust for factors which, which make a patient's subgroup um, atypical, but there is no, no substitute for a randomized controlled trial for evaluating um, the, the, the different treatments. There has been more recent interest in doing causal inference using observational data. Um, using um, something called uh, um, target emulation. So this is trying to e emulate a target randomized trial, which we'll, I, I will describe a bit later today. So a, a common question is whether a combination of treatments um, is, prefer is preferable to a single treatment. And then survival time is usually measured from um, the date of diagnosis 
or the date of first hospital admission or date of first treatment. However, in order to receive the combination um, tra treatment, one must first survive um, a sufficient period after um, surgery in order to, 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 to receive the, um, the radiation um, therapy. So those who die during or immediately after surgery are included in the surgery only group. A naive analysis um, of these data would show that the group receiving combination th therapy um, experience superior survival. Just, just to go back there, sorry, just to go back. Uh, but, but the the issue is that um, if you were doing an intention to treat analysis from a target emulated trial, then um, um, those who died immediately after could be randomised to be in either arm. Sorry. Uh, a, a brief. Um, um, Include talking about risk pr prediction. Uh, this is no new math. It's just basically saying um, that um, from the survival e estimates that we have been um, showing um, th throughout the course, they can be used to predict risks. So risk, you could also have done this as being um, f of t given x is one one minus um, survival at time t given x, which can be, um, and then survival can, can can be calculated from the cumulative hazard function. And then it, it, if that the hazard lambda is constant, then this, this basically just becomes lambda t. And then we have this for, formula for risk. Moreover, from Cox regression, the baseline survival is not of the t, t um, can be estimated using the Breslow estimator. And then th this can be, um, and, 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 and we can use the predict function um, to calculate uh, the Bre Breslow estimator. And for a linear predictor here, then the risk at time t given, given covariates is 1 minus the baseline survival raised to the power of the hazard um, ratio for given covariates. Standard errors and confidence in intervals for the risk estimates from Cox re re regression can be um, uh, calculated by re-parameterizing the, the model so that when x is equal to 0, that actually re represents the covariates of interest. So we can calculate risk um, from survival analysis and use that for doing predictions for diff different groups. Moving on to um, guidelines for publishing and presenting survival studies. There's a very nice review. Um, um, it's, it's quite old now, um, but I think it's, it's still, still quite useful. Um, this was a re review of um, 132 papers um, involving survival data. But the re review wasn't re restricted to um, observational epidemiology and keep in mind that this has got to focus on cancer um, and that the um, practices um, differs between disciplines. After reviewing the papers, the, the authors um, suggested um, guidelines for presentation of survival analyses. So when you're publishing your, your, your study, you should describe the, um, um, the, the data carefully. You should describe how the um, data were collected or obtained. And if the data were obtained from a registry, give a brief description of the, the, the registry and inf information on quality and um, com completeness. You should also describe any inclusion criteria, um, such as the dates of the diagnosis and the end of follow-up. You should also describe exclusion criteria, such as how did, did you handle for death certificate only um, cases or, um, or autopsy cases. You should report how many subjects were lost to follow up and how um, they were handled in the analysis. And it's also useful to, to report the um, sample size as in the, um, the number of individuals at risk 
and the m numbers of events for for each endpoint. And this gives a size of sort of like how much person time, and this gives you a sense as to the precision um, for uh, the um, regression approaches. You should also um, um, to define the follow-up time and endpoints. So you should, should de de define the um, time scale. Particularly, you should um, define the time origin and the events of interest. You should define uh, explicitly um, when um, uh, results will be censored. You should also define um, how how the um, what was the end of study. And um, it, it's also useful to, to provide some summary of the um, length of follow-ups, such as medians um, and the, the range. For describing the, the statistical methods, you should name the, the method used for, for estimating the um, um, survival probabilities, and that's likely to be um, Kappa-Meyer, but it could also be actuarial. You should name it any test used in the analysis, and that could be like a log rank, but it could also be from Cox or um, from the um, the model. Which uh, regression model did you use, and how was follow-up time modeled? So, did you use Cox or Poisson or Olin's additive hazards or flexible parametric style? models or something else. You should report all covariates included in the analysis, why they were included and how they were modeled. So um, if, if they were modeled as categories, you, you should say which categories. If you used l linear or quadratic effects or if you used um, splines, if you used a transformation of covariates. Importantly, you should comment on the missingness and how the, the, the missing data were handled in the analysis. You sh generally, you should um, um, consider re reporting a test for proportional hazards, and if the proportional hazards assumption did not hold, then, then you should say how that was handled. Um, just a, as a bit of a side point here, so. It's very common for statistical reviewers to ask for a um, test of proportional hazards. But if you think about proportional hazards as being essentially an interaction between time and covariates, then they're asking for you to focus on a particular set of interactions. And it's unclear why the time covariate interactions should be treated as being more important than interactions between the other um, variables. For some reason, the statistical reviewers do see this as being a more important set of interactions, but it doesn't necessarily actually make sense. And you should also name the, um, the software used. For presentation of the results, it's, it's useful to give a summary of overall survival, such as um, um, reporting median survival, or you could even do 10% um, survival, or the, the, or the proportion to surviving um, five years or 10 years. If relevant, also gives a summary of survival for different groups. When presenting the re results of a log rank or ranked Wilcoxon test, you should report the p-value and also re report the numbers of, of observed and expected events, because that gives you a sense of the direction of the effect. So when pre presenting results from a regression analysis, report the estimated hazard ratios with their confidence in, in, in intervals, and you could report the um, p-value as well. So, For the graphs, use meaningful time intervals and don't forget to label the axes appropriately. C consider marking soil time of um, censored individuals and to give the, um, the, the number um, of risk at so selected time points. And if you look at the CRAN um, survival task view, there's a, a, a number of packages which give these quite rich plots. Um, if um, several curves are re reported um, in, in the same plot, use different line types um, or colors. 
So you, you can mark or, or show confidence intervals and a comment from um, from Paul Digman. It's tr traditional to present um, uh, solid curves as a descriptive analysis, but then model the, the rates. If you have no particular interest in the um, solver curves, you could consider presenting graphs of the um, hazard instead. Right, to wrap up, I thought I should um, actually very briefly touch um, on um, topics that we have not covered, but which um, um, there are courses available. Uh, we've, we've already um, talked um, briefly about um, emulated target trials. So um, for causal inference using observational data, we may be interested in emulating a target randomized trial. And Anna and um, um, Robbins, they provide a useful introduction to this, what will become, I believe, an increasingly important epi epidemiological method. The um, target emulation should account for elig eligibility criteria much as you would for a, a target trial, um, treatment strategies, which are typically for the observational data are going to be pragmatic interventions. Um, the assignment procedures, which again for observational data will typically be without blinding. Um, the follow-up period and the very important um, um, point made by um, Hernan is that quite often you might have prevalent cases rather than incident cases. So it's very important to think about time zero. The, the outcomes, are they well validated from the observational data? And um, you, should, you should specify the causal contrast of interest and um, clearly specify the analysis plan. And I believe that Miguel Hernan will, um, will be teaching a course on emulated tr um, um, trials um, during possibly 2021 or 2022, and I think this would be excellent. So next topic is frailty models that individuals within a group may have more similar hazards than in individuals between groups. And, and we can then model for the variance um, between groups using shared frailty models. Alternatively, what we could have is that in, in individuals may experience one or more of one of a type of, of event, and then these are called recurrent events. And both of these um, types of data are their correlated outcomes, um, and that we should take that into account. For competing risks, um, the, the focus here is on the probability of experiencing a particular event in a defined um, period in the presence of competing events. For example, are men more likely than women to be admitted to, to hospital between ages 70 and 79 years for stroke? And in this case, men have, may have a higher incidence of stroke, but they are also more likely to die due to other causes. In this particular um, setting, we, do, we, we don't censor for the competing com com events. We actually allow for the fact that they um, um, are no longer at risk, but that the but that um, um, but that doesn't change the probability. So, the multi for, for multi-step models, this is a generalization of the competing risks when an individual may move between different health or disease states with competing events. And then we can then estimate the proportion of individuals on in each of the um, states at a given time. So several courses um, have been held in the last few years on competing risks and multi-state models. Um, there's been one by um, um, Hein Putter and Ronald Geskis, and another by uh, Michael Crowther and uh, Paul Lambert. There's also been one course on frailty models and recurrent events by Virginie Rondo, but it's been a few years. Exercises um, for today. Um, exercise 22 is um, estimating the effect of a time for varying exposure um, using the bereavement um, data. Exercise 23 is est estimating standardized mortality ratios. Exercise 25, um, we're looking at uh, 
um, nested case control studies. And exercise 28, which is quite a long one, is modeling cause um, specific survival using flexible parametric models. And here are a list of re references. Thank you very much.